Hey, I'm Noble. Thanks for checking out the message today. I'm so thankful that you're here and we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is you can text River Connect one word to 97000. You can also go through our website and find out more about us and see what we have coming up. Lastly, if you'd like to give to the River Church, you can text an amount to 84321 or you can go to the giving tab at the top of the page. I just want to thank you for being with us today and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye now. So tonight we are going to be continuing our series on prayer. And I thought to myself, what better way than opening our series or opening our message tonight our time together, then through prayer. So if you would, bow your heads with me. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. Lord, we are so incredibly thankful that we have a place where we can come, we can be in community with other believers, we can worship you, that we can pray, that we can dive into your word, and that we can turn to you. And Lord, that we have this time tonight. Pray that you'd bless us and you'd help us to understand and that you'd give us clarity through your, the power of your spirit. In your precious and holy name, Jesus' name, amen. amen. So if you would, open with me to the book of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 tonight. And so we've been in this series talking about prayer and, and, and this idea of praying through it and how a lot of times Prayer can be a difficult thing, right? Sometimes prayer can be easy, but a lot of times there are a lot of obstacles that we put in our own way that keep us from praying. But we talked about, I, I, I highlighted last week specifically our need for prayer, right? How in our recovery journey, prayer is a lifeline. Right? If you want to go back to the, the who wants to be a millionaire, right? And it's our phone a friend, but our friend is greater than any other ever, right? It is our lifeline. He is our answer. He is who we go to in our times of need. He provides, he cares for, he forgives. He is all, and he is all we'll ever need. And so our prayer is so incredibly vital, we have to figure out how to pray in the face of a myriad of different things that we like to put in our way. And one of the things that I think gets in a lot of people's way, specifically those of you who maybe didn't grow up in the church, or maybe you're very new to your walk with Christ, is prayer can be really intimidating, Right? Sometimes, you know, because we, we maybe have been around a pastor or we've been in a, a group and our table leader is, you know, especially good at prayer, whatever that means, right? We get intimidated because we're like, man, I don't talk like I live in 17th century England, right? I don't know how to use the proper these and thous. And, you know, they're talking about the blood and I'm still figuring out what that even means. And, you know, they're, they're using all these big names for God and I don't know all those names. And so we feel intimidated because we're like, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to pray, right? I hear that a lot. People come and they talk to me and, I, and I'm like, man, you... you you should really be looking at praying and regularly be praying and talking to the Lord. And, and they look at me and they say, Justin, I don't even know how to pray because I don't know what it looks like. And we think that we have to say these certain things. We have to do these certain things. And, that, you know, different things uh, make our prayer, like, like God only picks up the phone if we, you know, like do these certain steps and, and we say these certain things like, uh, or he just sends us to voicemail if we don't. But that's not the case. And in Matthew chapter six, what's happening is Jesus, he's partway through his Sermon on the Mount. If you don't know the Sermon on the Mount, I encourage you, maybe spend some time this week reading the entire Sermon on the Mount, or maybe this month, because it is a chonker. It takes you a little bit to get through. Um, but he spends this time in Matthew chapter 6, and he's teaching specifically about prayer. Actually, in this whole passage of Matthew chapter 6, we've been going through it uh, in our regular Sunday morning series, Jesus is kind of comparing 
what they've seen done by their spiritual leaders, by the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees were the ones that were guiding and directing and teaching about the spiritual practices of the day. He says, you've seen these things done by the Pharisees, but that's not at all how you should do it. It's actually the opposite. And so he talks about a bunch of different things. He, he deals with um, forgiveness. He deals with uh, he deals with giving. He deals with prayer. Is what we're talking about tonight. He deals with a bunch of these different things. And so we pick up in Matthew chapter six. We're going to be starting in verse nine, where Jesus says, "If you don't know what to say in prayer." Here is a great example. And I want to be really clear before we dive in. Uh, a lot of times this is labeled the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but before we dive in, that Jesus is not saying pray these words specifically. That every single one of your prayers needs to be this. Actually, if you go back to verse 7, this is a, a little bit of background knowledge. If you go back to verse 7, Jesus says specifically, it doesn't need to be all these lofty words. It doesn't need to be this very specific wording. It's important that it comes from the heart. He says, but if you're really wrestling with how to pray or maybe what you should say as you go to God, here is an example not a dictation, not how it's exactly supposed to be. He says, here's a great example. So we're going to dive in tonight. Turn with me there, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9. It says this. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And I love that he starts off with that same assertion, right? In verse nine, pray then like this. He doesn't say pray this. He says, pray like this. Here is a great template. And so we're going to look at a couple different things tonight about this prayer specifically. But I have to tell you, as I prepared for this message, it was really difficult for me because this is a very deep prayer. There's a lot to this prayer. And it was really difficult for me for two main reasons. The first one is, truthfully, if I'm gonna be honest, each one of these lines of these verses could be a sermon in and of themselves. Right, Really easily, we could look at each one of these things verse by verse because they're so profound and they impact us and they should impact our hearts in such an amazing way that I really could talk all night about it. The second thing is, each one of these things, each one of these things that he goes to the Lord in prayer about is actually... Uh, a, a very long rabbit trail that we could go down because really what it does is it ties into the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. It's kind of his outline for the rest of what he's teaching on. And so if something tonight, if you're like, man, I really gravitate with that verse or man, I'm really struggling in that area, here's what I'll say. Keep scanning down because there's a section in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus tackles that issue again at length. So I'd encourage you of that. But tonight, we're specifically going to look at what this prayer teaches us about how we pray. Why does he pick these things to share with us as he gives us an example for prayer? And so he starts out here by acknowledging who he's praying to, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? He's talking about the holiness of God and how he's praying to God, the Father. There's this intimate connection. There's this intimate uh, desire and communication that's happening between our Father who is in heaven, who wants to hear, who is ready to hear from us. And then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's talking about the very will of God. And he says, these things are, should happen, help me to fall in line. But the things that we're gonna take a look at at length is 11, verse 11, 12, and 13. And the reason for that is because 
These are things that Jesus goes and he goes before the Lord and asks for. He, he puts in his request. He says, these are the things that I need and I need you to take care of. We have a lot of needs, right? Right, we have a lot of needs. Uh, that is a, like, y'all don't have a lot of needs? Come on, you're maybe not being honest with yourself, but like, I got a lot of needs. I got a lot of things that I need taken care of. Now, maybe you're someone who prides themselves on not needing a lot. You're lying to yourself. I'll just be honest, right? I was in that spot for a while. I don't need nothing from nobody. There's a reason why you're struggling to keep it together. That's the reality. And so there are these specific needs that Jesus decides to teach the disciples about. He says, these are some very core needs that you have, and you should go to the Lord with these things. And so they show us how we should refocus our hearts as we pray. So we're going to start right away with this first request, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, at first glance, this may seem like a very simple request, right? You look and you're like, oh, yeah, uh, he's asking for food. He's asking for a provision for their physical needs. And a lot of people, when they read this, they assume that like that was what the disciples were in desperate need for, right? The disciples, they were not made of money. They were so poor that their need was for bread that day, that they had no food. They had no way to get food and they needed bread that day. And if God didn't provide for them, they would go hungry. Now that is not the case. Right? The disciples were not like on the verge of like starvation, right? They were not so squalid that they didn't have food or they didn't have money for food. Judas's role as one of the 12 disciples was he held the money pouch. There's no need for him to have that role if there wasn't money. He's not just carrying around an empty bag, right? Your job is to just watch this little pouch. No, his job was to watch and account for the money. He was the budget guy. So they had money. They had money for food. But on top of that, they, many of the disciples were experienced fishermen. So not only did they have food, right, or have the ability to go and get food, they had the skills to get the food they needed. If they didn't have money, what would they do? Oh, a bunch of them are great fishermen. They'd go out and catch their food. But on top of that, not only do they have money for food, not only do they have the skills to obtain food, they were often very regularly invited into people's homes to have dinner with them. Or they were given food by people who were wanting to bless them, right? They had means by which to get food. They were not like just starving on the verge of starvation in this desperate need for their daily bread. So if that is the case, why then does Jesus say, all right, first request that we're going to put into God, give us this day our daily bread. The servant's like, we had bread today already, Jesus. I don't know if you know that, Right? We, we, have, we have money for bread for tomorrow. Why are we asking God for this? Doesn't he have a better, better use of his time, his spiritual time? And there's a reason, there's, I think there's two main reasons why Jesus included this and why he starts off this way. The first reason, Jesus teaches us to pray for our daily bread to remind us that our Father has provided for our basic needs. Right? He says, pray like this because in the past, in all these different ways, God has shown up and he has provided. He cares about your physical well-being and he cares about your emotional. He cares about your needs, all of your needs, from the tiniest to what you eat to the largest of what is going on that is earth-shaking in your world. He cares and he has provided in the past. And you could go to a bunch of different scripture passages where specifically with the Jewish people, which the disciples were Jewish, right? With the, the Israelites, God had specifically provided for them bread, food, stuff to eat. 
He says, he has provided. Remind yourself as you pray, as you pray, your mindset should be in thankfulness, in reverence, and going to God who has and continues to provide for you. Set your heart on that. Remind yourself that in the past, you would have gotten nowhere if it hadn't been for the provision of God in your life. It is a heart posturing. It's a reminder of why you work. You work according to God's will. He gives you the ability to work. He provides in every single way for the daily bread which you consume. But then I think there's a second reason. And you may hear it and you're like, wait, 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 isn't that the same as the first? No, there's a key difference. I'm gonna try and highlight it. Let's see if you can pick it out. Jesus teaches us to pray for our daily bread to remind us that our Father will provide for our basic needs, right? That, there's a key difference, right? He has provided for our basic needs and he will provide for our basic needs. That he is the one that we should go to. God provides for our, all of our needs, both by maybe providing them directly. Maybe it's food showing up at your door or it's granting you the ability to provide for yourself. How do you think you have the skills and abilities that you have? How do you think you got the opportunity at your job that you got? How do you think the food that made it to your table was grown? According to the will of God, he at every step of the process of your most basic need, which is to eat, provided. And here's the thing, he will continue to do so. So why seek anywhere else? Why run to other things? Right, it's that attitude of he has, right, thankfulness, humility, a desire to use those gifts wisely, but it is an also a realization, a, a come to Jesus moment, if you will, of he will always be the provider. So stop putting it on yourself. As I read this passage, as I studied, I was in a commentary by uh, a pastor. His name is John MacArthur. And he, he included this section. And as I read it, as I was preparing, I was just like hit right in the heart. I was like, oh. So I have to share it with you this evening. It says this. When all our needs are met and all is going well in our lives, we are inclined to think that we are carrying our own load. We earn our own money, we buy our own food and clothes, we pay for our own houses, yet even the hardest working person owes all that he earns to God's provision. Our life, our breath, our health, possession, talents, and opportunities all originate from the resources that God created and made available to man. Yet we think that we got it under control. Yet we think we're, we're the big man on campus. That it's by our hard work that I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. Jesus says, pray like this as a reminder that you should turn to him. That you should turn to God for these needs. You should stop trying to go it alone for your needs. Because you're not going it alone already. So why not go to the Lord? Why not use that lifeline and go to him and humble yourselves and turn your heart to him in need? See what I meant by each one of these verses could be its own sermon, <laughs> right? But let's keep going. Next one, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You see, the word here that is translated to debt, it's one of the words that scripture uses for sin, right? There, there's a bunch of different words that the Bible uses to communicate 
sin and what it means to sin. And here it's translated to debt because that is literally what it's saying. It's almost using that financial term of debt, right? And if you don't know what sin is, sin is disobedience from God. It is doing the opposite of what God has called us to do, what he has laid out for us in his plan for us as his children. And what he says here is, this sin is like a financial debt. And the more and more you sin, the deeper and deeper and deeper into debt you get. And you, of your own accord, cannot work yourself out of it. You will never have money in your account to pay that debt off. But God, right? God loved us and he cared for us and he saw the need that we had in our spiritual debt. And so he sent his son, Christ Jesus, who's teaching here, who lived a perfect life and who went to the cross and he shed his blood and his blood paid off our debt. And he rose again, say, uh, showing that it was paid in full and then he still had money in the bank, right? And there's this beautiful picture of forgiveness, right? We have been forgiven of our debts. And so Jesus, he reminds them that forgiveness can only come from God. And he knows what he is here to do on earth, right? This is before he died on the cross and before he rose again, right? So he's teaching, and this is a foreshadowing of the forgiveness that will be given. So he says, as you pray, right, as I'm not here to continue to teach you how to pray, you should turn to God and thank him for the forgiveness that he gives you through me. And he says, remind yourself of that. Remind yourself of that. But it's interesting, right? He's talking to the disciples, his followers, people who are following him. So haven't they like been forgiven? Or like when he teaches them to pray, doesn't he know that like his blood will, will be shed for them? So why does he specifically say, when you pray, you should pray like this. This should be a regular thing. Well, here's the thing. Confession and seeking forgiveness should be a regular thing in your life. Right? A lot of times we think, okay, once I've asked for forgiveness at salvation, then I'm good. Right? I don't ever have to ask for forgiveness again. And there is truth, right? The blood of Jesus Christ has atoned for your sin. Right? You have been forgiven. And all your sins, both past, present, and future have been covered by the blood of Christ Jesus. So if you forget to ask God for forgiveness one day, it's not like, oh, those sins aren't covered. So please hear that. But there's a reason why he says you should seek continual forgiveness because here's the thing. I know this is a shocker to you. Even after salvation, you continue to sin. And scripture says there is a continual need to seek forgiveness from that sin. In places like James 15, 6, Proverbs 28, 13, 1 Timothy 6, 12, Psalm 32, 5, to name a few. But the reason why we do this is as we sin, and our sin is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ before God as judge, our Father is grieved as we sin. He sees our sin and he's saddened. Why? Because God wants what's best for you and sin is never what is best for you. In fact, it harms you, it kills you, it leads you to death. And it grieves him, it saddens him. And so there's this this twist, this fracture of relationship, right? And this hurt and this grief and this pain. And so as we, as believers, go to our Father, we must seek forgiveness for 
the pain that we've caused. It's a relationship, right? It, it, it's this relationship between us and our Father. We have to work through those things. We can't just pretend like they didn't happen. They did. They did. Christ Jesus bled and died for them. They happened. So we must seek forgiveness. But as we seek forgiveness, it's a sobering reminder of how deep that sin runs. That that sin is not just, uh, oh, oh yeah, I sinned. Better do better next tomorrow. Right? That our sin is sin. It is death. And as we seek forgiveness from God, it should be a reminder of our need for obedience. It should remind us of the sobering fact of how we attained the forgiveness we had. How we attained the forgiveness that Christ Jesus went to the cross and died for. And it should push us. It should be a reset on our heart that reminds us of the need we have to live in the obedience of God. And when we pray this, we set our minds on forgiveness, both our need for forgiveness and, he continues, our need to forgive others. Some of you are like, Justin, I'm out. I'm ready to go to table groups. So we don't need to talk about forgiving others, Right? Because forgiving others is difficult. It's hard. We've been wounded. We've been hurt. We've been stabbed in the back. We've been lied to. We've been betrayed. You know who else was betrayed? You know who else was stabbed in the back? You know who else was wounded? Our Father. By us. Over and over and over and over again, yet he still forgives. So why can't you figure out how to forgive again? Now, I'm not saying it's easy. Please hear that. I'm not saying it's that easy. But we have to be reminded of the necessity to forgive. We have been forgiven. And it goes back to that age-old saying, forgiven people forgive. When you know what the forgiveness of God feels like in your life, you start to figure out what it means to forgive others who have hurt you. Like I said, not easy. Not an instant thing. But you realize in the same way there was a need for you to be forgiven, there's a need for you to forgive. When we truly understand the forgiveness of God as both judge and father, our forgiveness of other people pales in comparison. It doesn't make it less difficult, but it does make it all the more necessary. Last thing as we close. It says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, if we look at verses like James 1, 13, we know that God is not the one who tempts. He does not lay out evil before you and say, oh, I hope, hope they pick the right one. No, in fact, he is our avenue out of temptation. We look at verses like 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13. And if you do not have this highlighted in your Bible or memorized, now this should be a wake-up call. This is a key verse in your recovery journey. When you experience temptation, right here. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13, it says this. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will, he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So here's what this means. You can't look back after you've relapsed, after you've done that thing you know you shouldn't have done and say, well, pff, the temptation was too much for me. I had no choice. No, this verse says, no, you had. God always provides you a way out. You know what that way out is? 
Prayer and his word. Prayer and his word. And so what Jesus does here is he includes this, not as saying, God, don't tempt me or don't lead me into temptation. No, it is an affirmation. God, you will never lead me into temptation. So help me follow you. God, I want to follow you and lead me, pull me, drag me if you have to, because you will always deliver me from evil. You will never lead me into temptation. Man, that's a need for us in our prayer lives, amen? We have a need for godliness. We have a need to follow as he leads us, not into temptation, but into obedience, into holiness, as he provides us that avenue. And so for me, when I'm in times of temptation, I turn to this verse. Lord, it, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13, you will provide me a way of escape. Lord, that you are faithful. Lord, I, I need that escape right now, please. Lord, please show up. Lord, lead me not into temptation. Lead me. I know you'll lead me away. Help me to follow. And so we see, right, this prayer is a dedication to the Lord's plan. It's reminding what it means to live for God and follow him. It's dedicating ourselves to following the way in which the Father leads, which is away from godlessness into godliness. And so as, as Jesus teaches his disciples, right, he's teaching them not specific words that they need to recite. He's not saying, say these words and these things will happen. Right? It's not magic. He's saying, no, these things, you should pray these things regularly because it helps renew, refresh your heart. It helps focus your mind on where your needs come from, on where your forgiveness is found, how you should live in light of that forgiveness and how you stand up in the face of temptation. Prayer is the thing that strengthens. It hydrates, it renews, it refreshes. It does this again and again and again. That's why verses in scripture say, pray without ceasing. The idea is not that you never stop mumbling prayers. The idea is that your mind continues to stay renewed as you stay devoted to the relationship that you have with your father. If you have been in the church for a while, or maybe you've heard this prayer recited for a while, you may see maybe a piece of this prayer that's missing, right? At the end of verse 13, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Well, the reason why this isn't included in the ESV is because uh, as they were translating scripture, they found that older manuscripts of the Bible didn't have this. That as Jesus was teaching, he wasn't praying. He was saying, pray like this. And he was reciting those words to them as they taught. And what they found was actually in the very early church, the early church had included this line for the purpose of praying together in unity. That they would recite this prayer together and that they would do this because as they pray... They would unify themselves in their attitude toward their heavenly father. That they were unified in their needs from their heavenly father. That they were unified in refreshing their minds as they tackled their days and their weeks ahead of them. And so they included this so they could pray together. And so tonight, I want us to pray this together. Now, if you, if you want to pray it out loud, feel free to pray it along with me. If you want to pray it in your, in your seats quietly, if you want to remember this and, and recite it, maybe as we jump into this next song of worship, feel free to do all those things. But let this be a reminder of your need for prayer, of your need for the Lord in these things. And maybe let it be 
a reminder this week that maybe you need to start praying. Maybe this series has been just a gut punch to you and you've just seen, man, I need to be praying more often. You do. (laughs) I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I need to. We all need to be seeking the Lord in prayer because that is our lifeline. But tonight, join with me together. It's going to be on the screen, but let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as also, or we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.